Hi, Jim here, and you're listening to the Honest Filmmaker podcast, career advice from people in the business. Now, unfortunately, I didn't make it to the Cannes Film Festival this year, but I know a man who did. Friend of the pod, Mark Hampton, went over to Cannes and gave us some great insight on what it's like to be a filmmaker, gave us a bit of a tour of the Palais, and also spoke to some sales agents about trends in the market this year. Enjoy. Hello, it's Mark Hampton here, and I'm at the Cannes Film Festival for the Honest Filmmaker podcast. Garda Can, probably the first thing you'll see if you're a filmmaker on a budget here at Can. All you need to know is, cross the road, head down the hill, and you'll find yourself on the Croisette. And you will land at the Palais. Now this is where they always have an enormous version of whatever that year's poster is. And this is where you do your obligatory just landed in Can selfie. So once you're in the International Village, if you're from the UK, make your way to the UK Pavilion. This is where they have talks, they have uh, events, uh, and they have tea and coffee but no Wi-Fi. One of the great things about the uh, UK Pavilion is that it's on the beach with this view. Cannes is, of course, one of the big events on the film festival calendar, um, but at the same time as the festival, you also get the market, and it's kind of unusual in that they uh, both happen at the same time and at the same place. We're now going through the basement entrance of the Marche du Film. So the market here in Cannes is packed with production companies, distribution companies, sales agencies, representatives from different countries all over the world, all trying to sell their wares, attract uh, buyers, sellers, the whole lot. Uh, and I managed to speak to a few, so let's hear what they had to say. The market's been slow, uh, but there's a lot of movies here, and it just means it's a lot more work to pick through and find the gems. Uh, uh, you know, there's probably more than 5,000 movies here. Some people are saying it's 15,000. So there's an enormous amount of movies here. And I think that's pent up supply from after COVID and after the actor's strike. Yeah. Uh, what we bought a movie, which is this wild movie called Putin from Polish director uh, Patrick Vega. And it's the life of Vladimir Putin, but it's all AI and he's got a new process. And you're looking at Putin and you don't realize it's not the real guy. So there are advantages to AI for an audience. It'll put you right into a movie. So that kind of evolved out of this market. And that's great new technology to help filmmakers. Are you seeing more of that coming in? I mean, that's a great example of a, of a use of it. Are you seeing more filmmakers to using um, AI to kind of level up their game without perhaps the, yeah, the budget? Yeah, I, th I think that, um, rightly so, filmmakers are reticent to use AI to replace actors, but to replace public figures is a whole other thing. And uh, I think there's clear sailing there. So I hope more filmmakers kind of consider that possibility because that opens up a range of characters for people uh, uh, that before wasn't there. Amazing. And uh, what's your highlight so far? Uh, well, buying that movie for the US would be a highlight. Uh, I met with Billy Zane, and he has a fabulous movie called Waltzing with Brando, in which Billy Zane plays Marlon Brando. And that is the most fabulous movie. You cannot tell which one is Marlon Brando. Wow. <laughs> so that's, that's, you know, that's a good movie. Brilliant. Can was um, very similar to how it was last year, actually. It's a slow market, but it does tick over. And um, uh, even though, you know, it's nowhere near as busy as it used to be 10 years ago, we're still doing enough business to, you know, sort of make returns for the producers. Um, and um, but what we're finding is that the landscape is changing. Um, whereas in the past we'd uh, always sell to Japan, um, always sell to Germany. Um, now it's um, it's more Southeast Asia, okay. Latin America, uh, Turkey, the Middle East. These are the new emerging territories who are, who are you know who are paying more than the, a U.S. distributor would pay. Um, so. Even though there are some countries, some territories that are underperforming, there are new territories that are overperforming. So it's, 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 it's balancing itself out. What do you think is driving that shift, that change? It's a combination of things. I mean, um, uh, the, the new emerging territories, uh, uh, small independent film, 
can go uh, theatrical on you know three to six hundred screens yeah. because of digital technology because um, the the distributors don't need a 35 mil print they they can do it digitally for a GCP um, and also the economies of these countries um, they have a much bigger middle class that has right. you know sort of expendable cash and they they want to go to the movies you know and are, are those audiences more likely to get up and actually go to the cinema than your traditional europe us yeah yeah i think we've we've become sort of uh uh you know sort of catch potatoes and 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 watching uh, films uh in streaming yeah and um, is is streaming a big part of that, what's happened to that the to audiences uh, appetite for cinema yeah yeah we've got out we've got out of the habit of going to the cinema yeah. um, and we're watching you know, we're watching films at home. We're even sort of buying drinks, you know, out. We, we don't go to the pub anymore. We, we buy drinks in supermarkets yeah. and bring it home. You know, so it's not just film. Um, it's, uh, it, it, it's um, you, you know, uh, the cost of living. Um, it means that, you know, you can't, how, how, how expensive is it to take a family to the cinema? Yeah, it's a lot, yeah, right? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, uh, but, it, you know, it's, as I said, you know, yes, it's a problem. I mean, most UK distributors, for example, now don't buy for the UK. Right. They're buying for North America. Yeah. Okay. North America is a much bigger territory. It has um, uh, many more digital platforms. And, um, you know, whereas a UK distributor is lucky to break even um, on a UK release, they're going to go well into profit in the US. Um, so territories are breaking down. Yeah. Um, I just saw the film to Italy. The problem the Italians have is they have to do a uh, Italian dub that costs fifteen thousand. Costs money, yeah. Yeah. So they mitigate the rest by uh, including Filipino and Indonesian non-exclusive AVOD rights in addition to the the Italian territory. Right. Okay. So back. if if they can't recoup uh, uh, their MG and their um, their dubbing costs from uh, revenue from their home territory. They they can exploit the film in Indonesia and Philippines, and right. that should put them into profit. Are MG still a thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're getting smaller in some territories, like the UK is is is, is tiny now. Uh, the US is small too, uh, you yeah. know. Um, and um, when you compare, I'm I'm getting bigger MGs uh, from. Um, Southeast Asia than I'm getting and Latin America than I'm getting from the US. Right, okay. Um, you, the US is traditionally worth about 33 to 50% of the market. Um, and if, if, if a, an American distributor is offering you a five grand MG, mm. <laughs> what, what does that say? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Wow. Uh, whereas, you know, with a, it's possible to get 40,000 from Southeast Asia. Wow, that's um, a real difference. So, yeah. Finally, what's your highlight of Cannes so far this year? The highlight of Cannes this year? Um, well, I just had a meeting with a Chinese uh, producer who is remaking um, in Chinese um, a Venezuelan film that I sold 10 years ago called The House at the End of Time. Um, and, um, and he came in to see what other films I have uh, that that's available for remake. A remake, yeah. And uh, this is um, another new revenue stream. Yeah. Uh, the House at the End of Time has already been remade in Korean. Now it's going to be remade in, in Chinese. Um, and because it's originally Spanish, we 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 did have a deal with New Line Cinema to do a Hollywood remake in studio in, remake in English. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, even though the the distribution market is struggling. There's still other ways you can monetize IP, and monetize you know scripts. And there's films. a there's a big there's a there's a big kind of remake campaign in Cannes this year, isn't there? There's a real push to trying to get ter get titles um, and make them available for remake for you yeah. know, Western, but it sounds like other other yeah. territories as well, which is phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's um it's it's a sort of a a, a growing thing because yeah. the value of films are getting less and less, but if if you can remake then suddenly you can all all the money you lost you know in yeah. distribution you'll yeah. make back in remake um, so uh, like for example I, I would say that there was one film that I sold distribution worldwide probably sold it for about a hundred and fifty thousand right 
and I sold the remake rights for half a million. Wow. So that's where it's at then. Remake can make more money than distribution. Fantastic. How has the festival been for you so far this year? Uh, it's definitely been busier than uh, past years in some ways. I think that we have more buyers looking for films. But then I think on the filmmaker side, a lot more international finished films are here. Uh, which is kind of what you expect for Cannes, yeah. um, as opposed to the American film market where you have like more American movies. Um, but the films all look really, you know, well done, and and I think that the competition at Cannes is uh, is pretty fierce. So, awesome. What's your highlight of Cannes so far? Uh, highlight: we we hosted a party uh, at at a place called uh, Dolly, uh, along with uh, um, Mint. I forget the name of the company. <laughs> That's anyway. a good sign. <laughs> but we, we, we sponsored a party and had a really great time with all of our friends and, and filmmaker friends and, and partners and, you know, buyers and things like that. So that's been the highlight so far. Oh, and watching uh, Furiosa. That was pretty awesome. awesome. I, I hear it's amazing. That. It's amazing. Yeah. So there are some kind of mixed uh, reviews, some slower, some faster, some busier, some not so busy. But um, apparently there are a lot of movies here. There's some pent up demand from COVID still. So they reckon there's anywhere from five to 15,000 films in the market this year. Um, the market is laid out in a complex way. It's over several different levels and it's very easy to kind of get lost. But if you go from the, uh, the Marche entrance down to these elevators, you can go down to the cafe and get a coffee. And if you want one, it's a steal at just three euros 50 for a coffee. But uh, yeah, it's not too bad. It's a bit of a glass house, so it gets kind of hot. This is a USA pavilion. Uh, it's happy hour, which means free drinks. One of the most important things about Cannes is just to have an open mind and be open to take on opportunities when they arise. So I bumped into a mate walking down the closet and ended up in a punk rock party uh, on the top floor overlooking the bay. And that's just how things go here. So a big thank you to Mark for that report. Uh, if you're interested in more behind the scenes information from people working in the industry right now, please do subscribe to the Honest Filmmaker podcast.